How to find them? Informing, even by children, provided the answer. Olga Balikina, a young pioneer, denounced her father to the authorities for stealing on the collective farm. She became a heroine overnight, showered with approval and gifts. In the adult world, informers received part of the assets of their victims. It was a way of making money and settling old scores, taking over someone's apartment, their job, even their husband or wife. My mother told me that the only evidence that her arrested and gave her 8 years in charge of counter-revolutionary activities were evidence of Astrova. Она пришла со слезами, она не знала прежде об этом, она пришла со слезами и, и говорила, что какой ужас, как он мог. Как он мог, он же знал, что этого не было. The man who denounced Eichenwald's mother was Valentin Astrov. Ну, анализируйте все эти причины, но факт остается фактом. Народу-то я не изменял ведь тому, когда это делал, потому что весь народ так думал. А по существу, конечно, изменял, получается. Сейчас я вижу, и это мучительно очень. Astrov agreed to turn informer after a spell in prison and the removal of his party card. Позором сотрудничать с советскими социалистическими органами безопасности я не считал никогда и не считаю. И раньше не считал, когда не, 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 писал, не давал этого обязательства, не, не во время, когда я его давал, и когда сейчас. Это для меня была единственная ниточка, которая меня связывала с моей партией. The NKVD vans were known as the Black Ravens. They generally went out at night. Часа в два ночи, 21 ноября, раздался стук ко мне в комнату. Мы жили в общей квартире. Дома был мой муж и моя сестра, которая тогда со мной жила. Дверь открыла без ключ от нашей квартиры. Был у нашей дворничихи, которая занималась уборкой квартиры. И она без звонка открыла дверь и подвела прямо к нашей комнате что было довольно жестоко с ее стороны. Пришли два человека и делали тщательно, но мы спали. Они меня арестовали и привезли меня на Лубянку. Сталин легализовал тортуру как both justifiable and appropriate. The NKVD used beatings, water torture, electric shock. The most effective, though, was the simplest. Ну а самое обычное это не давать спать во время этого конвейера совершенно круглыми сутками. Я сам это прошел на Лубянке, просто не давали спать. Ты только утром собираешься встать, только собираешься э, э, собираешься вечером поздно лечь спать, как тебя вызывают на допрос. И когда ты утром после ночного допроса приходишь, хочешь отдохнуть, подъем тебя поднимают. И вот так сутки, вторые, третьи, по 10, по 15 дней человек не выдерживает. Тебя могли не бить, а просто бессонницей мучить. Vans from the Lubyanka brought the bodies of the dead down this road, five miles from the center of Moscow. They stopped here. In the late 30s, it was open ground. И однажды мы, значит, бежали сюда играть. Вот с этого бугорка. Вот, видим, машина стоит, машина стоит, и разгружают, в общем, людей, совершенно голых. Люди стояли, значит, человека три их было. Были на них одеты перчатки резиновые, халаты темные и фартуки резиновые. Вот они, значит, их и выкидывали. У них в руках были крючки, они и крючками их выкидывали. For those who survived interrogation, the next destination, and for millions the final destination, was the Gulag.
the camps filled up with party members, the military, artists, scientists, bureaucrats, even the NKVD itself. Понятно, что выжить, я уже говорил, что этапы приходят целыми поездами, и через две-три недели они плашмя лежат, плашмя лежат, да, опух, опухают и это, мочатся под себя, и уже встать не могут, и погибают и целиком. Survival exacted a terrible toll, as Olga Schlausberg realized when she finally got to a bathhouse with a mirror. Я кричу зеркало, зеркало, а мы побежали все, мы четыре года себя не видели, ну и все без платья, все голые, бежим к этому зеркалу. Подбежали цел толпа, и я не вижу где я, я не могу себя найти. Я же была молодая, я помнила себя молодой. И вдруг я увидела глаза моей мамы и седую голову с прощадью сильной. И я поняла, что это я. The camps spread across the land in clusters. The gold mining camps in the Far East with a special camp for torture and execution. Egarka in Siberia, with its lumber and port construction. Railway building in Pechora, coal mining in Forkuta. Bitterly cruel regimes in the harshest climates. The punishment of millions of innocent people. Many thought that Stalin knew nothing of the terror. If only he could be told, they said, he'd soon put a stop to it. But Stalin knew all about the terror. Я собственными глазами видел десятки, сотни документов, на которых стоит роспись Сталина, утверждение огромного количества списков к смертной казни. Наиболее потрясающие я такой документ, группа документов нашел, когда 12 декабря 1938 -го года Сталин и Молотов подписали около 30 списков но общей, общей численностью 3182 человека. 3182 человека к смертной казни в течение одного дня. И после этого, как я подсчитал, мне многие дни известны по часам даже, чем Сталин занимался, он пошел с Молотовым смотреть свой очередной ночной фильм. Сталин's daughter Svetlana once interceded to save the life of a school friend's father. She was told never to do it again. How does she feel about her father and the terror now? Well, he was the leader of the party uh, which performed all that. First of all, it's the fact which we all know. Can't get away with it. He was not alone. There was the whole Politburo which supported him and went with these policies. You, you cannot change history. I am not here to tell you to change history or to make it looking more pleasant or more agreeable or to uh, take out from there what I wish would never be there. I wish I, wish I could tell you that um, yeah, my father didn't have anything to do uh, with it, but I, I can't. By the late 30s, Stalin was increasingly capricious. He could be open, charming even. But his moods were ever more dark and suspicious. Alexander Avdienko, now a writer, 
was hauled before his hero for a film script Stalin didn't like. Stalin, I saw him in a meter from me. Он все время ходил вокруг, мимо меня. Он все время обращался ко мне, тыкал в меня трубкой и пальцем, не сводил с меня глаз. Гневный, желтый глаз, нечеловеческий глаз кишника. И очень громко разговаривал, кричал. У него была пена на губах. Он гневался, как бог Саваов. Он был абсолютно не похож на того Сталина, которого я привык видеть. There were still old enemies. The remnants of the leadership under Lenin were subjected to the biggest show trial of all, as Stalin tried to obliterate the parts of Soviet history he didn't like, in which he hadn't been the hero. The main accused were Lenin's old colleagues, ex-Prime Minister Alexei Rykov and Nikolai Bukharin. Bukharin had been the party theoretician, educated and popular. He and Stalin had ruled the Soviet Union together in the 1920s. Stalin had pushed him out of office and now wanted him dead. First, Bukharin had to be denounced by Valentin Astrov. <laughs> Пытался, так сказать, доказать ему, что надо признать такой смысл. Подтекст этого был. Что надо признать это, вот, что мы обязаны это сделать, раз партия этого хочет. Но смысл именно тот, что это ради... Ради социалистической родины, ради партии это сделано. The trial was a sham. The witnesses were bogus and their evidence false. Bukharin confessed to a general conspiracy charge, but turned the tables on the court by denying the detail of the accusation. His final speech expressed his complete loyalty to the party. Yet the motive behind his confession was perhaps less duty to party unity than fears for the safety of his wife and young child. Так что очень многие, множество сил действовало, потом пытки. И, несомненно, было колоссальное количество показаний против Бухарина, против Рыкова, потому что в первую очередь нужно было их убить. И они достигались ужасающими пытками. Это уже теперь доказано. Что касается Николая Ивановича, я слышала, что его физически не пытали, но насколько это верно, я не знаю. Ну, так, может, пытали Рыкова. Если Рыков ждал показаний, это, это, это было страшным ударом. Я не знаю, кто первый дал показания. Это трудно сказать. Но так или иначе, одно то, что они могли показывать друг против друга, уже говорит о том, какие методы к ним применялись. Stalin's chief prosecutor, Vyshinsky, summed up the spirit of the times. Bukharin, Rykov, and most of the others were shot. Bukharin's wife, Anna, spent over 20 years in the camps and Siberian exile. She did not see her baby son for 19 years. Trotsky in exile in Mexico was top of Stalin's hit list. Trotsky had been the leading figure alongside Lenin in both the revolution and civil war, a place in history Stalin bitterly envied. Trotsky tried to convince a world largely seduced by Stalin's propaganda that Stalin was, in fact, a dangerous despot. Stalin's trial against me is built upon false confessions extorted by modern inquisitorial method in the interest of the ruling clique. There are no crime in history more terrible in intention or execution than the Moscow trials of Zinoviev Kamenev and Radek 
Katakov. These trials developed not from communism, not from socialism, but from, from Stalinism. That is from the irresponsible despotism of the bureaucracy over the people. Trotsky's house in Mexico City was heavily fortified against attack. But in May 1940, he and his family narrowly escaped death when NKVD gunmen sprayed the bedroom with bullets. An NKVD assassin then infiltrated Trotsky's circle under the name Jackson. On the 20th of August, he went into Trotsky's study and plunged an ice pick into his head. Jackson spent 20 years in prison, but was rewarded by Stalin with the order of hero of the Soviet Union. The decade had begun with terror in the countryside, forced collectivization, the elimination of the so-called kulaks, the man-made famine. Even though Stalin turned on the party and the intelligentsia after the murder of Kirov, he kept up the pressure on the countryside throughout the 30s. Основная масса лагерников это были крестьяне и рабочие. Вот. Главным образом крестьяне. И они, скорее всего, как ни странно, погибали. Погибали от холода и голода, потому что они работали изо всех сил. И они поэтому скорее погибали. А массовые эти могилы разбросаны по всей нашей земле. Kuropati Forest, just outside Minsk, capital of the Soviet Republic of Bielorussia. Between 1937 and 1941, innocent, ordinary men and women were driven here in vans by the NKVD day and night. Ой, сколько ж я чула, это ж близко к Алинацу. А я же ночи последние разы уже я дежурила. Так и бачила, и чула все на свете. Як плакали, як кричали, як привязывать уже стрелять. А ночь тихо, уже машины тихо ходят, и все. Так и днем стреляли. И днем стреляли, было у них такое... Pits had been dug in the forest. Two people at a time were brought to the edge by uniformed NKVD men, shot from behind and pushed in, layer after layer, until the pit was full. Когда у зимовой могиле люди одетые были, ну зимовую его протку они занимали больше места. Там человек 150 умещался, а у летних могилах до 260 человек. У всех же могил у Куропатах, я уже сказал, больше тысячи. При этом есть могилы э, до уже не до 10 метров. Вот у таких могилах тысячи человек расстреляны и похованы. At least 100,000 men and women were killed in Kuropati forest. Zenon Posniak believes the total may be as high as a quarter of a million, and they are finding other forests like Kuropati. No one will know how many died under Stalin in the 30s until Soviet archives are opened. Maybe not even then. Estimates range from 8 to 14 million people killed. Even children were in the camps. <laughs> По территории Карлага, возле колючей проволоки, мы боялись выйти за эту зону. Мы ее так и называли за зоной. Потому что за зоной опасность. А в зоне, видать, ее не было. Сидели охранники наверху. Они нас наверняка охраняли. Это было счастье. И вроде бы и думать не надо. Маму-то мы знали по тюрьме, а папа и не задумывались. Есть ли папа? Сталин папа. The country was caught in a nightmare. Children were locked up. But so too was the wife of Kalinin, president of the Soviet Union. Some of Stalin's own relatives were arrested and shot. 
With war looming in Europe, Stalin executed 50,000 senior military officers, including three of the five Soviet marshals. The NKVD kept filling up the pits in Kuropati forest with dead bodies until the summer of 1941, when German troops came over the brow of the hill. The third and final part of Stalin is next Tuesday at 10.35. it's now almost four years since the disaster at Chernobyl, there is still considerable secrecy surrounding precisely what happened on the day the reactor caught fire. The full story of what happened there and how it's affected hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians has still to be told. Every mother don't know what will be tomorrow with her children because they are very ill now. April 26, 1986. A fire at Chernobyl causes the worst nuclear accident in history. Four years on, Eyewitness has been to the Ukraine to film a special report about the legacy of Chernobyl. Next week, we will be revealing for the first time the true extent of the tragedy. We'll be exposing the lack of medical supplies and equipment, which is preventing proper treatment of the victims. And we'll be talking to the families who have little hope, but much courage. And to the mothers who are trying to build a future for their children, a future full of uncertainty. We'll also show how public dismay about Chernobyl is fueling the Ukrainian nationalists' strive for independence from Moscow. The Ukraine should become a sovereign and independent republic without the Soviet Union. That's Children of Chernobyl, next week on Eyewitness. It was the worst riot in prison history, but why did Strangeways explode? Brute force is what ruled at Strangeways, and it was destroyed by brute force. Tomorrow, the government prepares to launch yet another war against drugs, while I visit a centre in Warrington that claims to have found a peaceful solution. Yeah, if it wasn't for this clinic, I would be in prison or I'd be dead. There's no doubt about that. Four years after the world's worst nuclear disaster, I'm in the Ukraine to discover the human cost of Chernobyl. Every mother don't know what will be tomorrow with her children because they are very ill now. Almost four years ago, a fire at a nuclear power station in the Ukraine threatened to devastate a large area of the Soviet Union and beyond. But in the days immediately after Chernobyl, it seemed disaster had been avoided. Lives were lost, but not as many as were first feared. Three weeks ago, a convoy of lorries from Britain headed for the Ukraine, filled with medical supplies. For it's only now that the full scale of what happened on that April day is finally becoming clear. April 26, 1986. A fire at Chernobyl causes the worst nuclear accident in history. Hundreds of thousands of people are exposed to massive doses of radiation. Officially, only 31 died. But four years on, the battle to survive Chernobyl is still being fought. 
We have less than 40% of the equipment we need. We don't have the right diagnostic equipment, nor the up-to-date instruments. Every mother don't know what will be tomorrow with her children, because they are very ill now. Kiev, the third largest city in the Soviet Union, just 40 miles from Chernobyl in the heart of the Ukraine. The region has grown rich as the breadbasket of the Soviet Union. Kiev has 18 fresh food markets like this one. Whilst there is plenty of produce on offer, these markets are unique. Everything here is tested for radiation. These farmers stand anxiously over the carcasses of their cattle about to be tested. Each market has a laboratory. The checks have driven many farmers out of business. Contamination of milk products was so bad that dairy farming has been devastated. Here there used to be 60 stalls selling it, now there are just 21. The livelihoods of the farmers are determined by this simple test in a Geiger counter. One and a quarter million people still live in areas of high background radiation. No one knows what the future holds, but children are already amongst the casualties. This Kiev hospital is filled with children suffering from radiation exposure. There are 130 currently being treated, but thousands more are waiting. 11-year-old Petrik is dying of leukemia. His father is sharing his son's last few days. But the radioactive cloud passed over your village. And uh, Pieter was outside. And he wasn't ill immediately after the explosion. It was two years at least. Hematologist Ala Chetnyashina has seen many tragic cases like Petrik's, for whom she can do nothing. Yeah. There's nothing you can do for him. I'm afraid that unfortunately nobody has found a cure for leukemia yet. He's going to die. Yeah. Hard evidence is now emerging about the likely cost in lives of Chernobyl. Scientists at the All-Soviet Radiological Research Center have studied 90,000 affected children. Professor Evgenia Stepanova says a fifth of them are now ill and predicts an extra 500 deaths from thyroid cancer. We are the first Western journalists to see her findings. We have here under medical observation more than 90,000 children from those areas in the Ukraine most affected by the Chernobyl explosion. These children are given a thorough medical examination twice a year. The results of these examinations indicate that while approximately 80% of these children appear to be in good health, 20% of them are suffering from various malfunctions of the organs and blood. We are convinced that these children's health has been adversely affected by a combination of damaging factors connected with the Chernobyl disaster. Concern over these children's prognosis is focused mainly on the condition of their thyroid glands. Research recently carried out at the radiology center revealed a 70% increase in the incidence of thyroid gland tumors. Can you just list a few of the basic medical items that you are short of? 
I'll start with the basic ones. We are desperately in need of disposable needles and syringes. The lack of these items is causing us huge problems in that we are unable to take all the blood samples that we need for our investigative and research procedures. This, in turn, reduces our scope for performing the diagnostic procedures that would enable us to ascertain the state of the children's health. 30,000 people in the town of Pripyat watched as the Chernobyl plant burned. They were just two and a half miles away. Now half the town, including three and a half thousand children, have been moved to this grim housing estate on the outskirts of Kiev. They live here in 15-storey tower blocks because their homes in Pripyat are too contaminated. Most of these people were exposed to a high dose of radiation and as a result are ill. Sadly, it's the children on the estate who were most vulnerable, and there are fears many will not live past their teens. Families like the Lukminas live with the tragedy every day. 35-year-old Titania was seven months pregnant at the time of the disaster. Знаете, в масках, в очках, в, в полной форме. А я стояла перед ними совершенно раздетая. И они долго совещали, что же со мной делать. Боялись той радиации. И мне пришлось... Ну, в общем, это... Отправили меня мыться. Потом снова, когда меня вели по коридору в одной ночной спиднице в той, то все казались, что это женка с радиацией. Ведь мне все уходы, ну, уходили до стороны. И сразу казали, что нужно сделать аборт. Но... Я гадала, що це не можна. Це вже сім, сім місяців було. Думала, гадала, що цей ребенок буде гарний, хороший. Це дитина зовсім така і вийшла. Але, знаєте, вже зараз вона має хронічне захворювання. Мы не знаем, сколько, какая, какую дозу мы получили. Нам до сих пор об этом не говорят. Но не кажут они, какая у нас доза. Не кажут. Но я знаю, что это старшая донька. Очень плохо стала очки бачить. Очень плохо. Она сейчас... Потом еще сердце у нее очень плохо. И кровь. Кровь очень плохо у нее. А эта маленькая... Тоже все время кажется, что у нее животик болит. Где у тебя животик болит? Покажи, Леночка, болит животик, так? Она очень хорошо знает, где у нее болит животик. Ей всего три роки. Три. Специалисты в Израиле have confirmed 13-year-old Natasha has an overactive thyroid. But because there are so many children like Natasha and her sister Alonya, the ill-equipped Soviet health service is just too overburdened to offer any solutions. What about the future? Do you have any hope? Нет. Знаете, так хочется, чтобы дети были счастливы. Но разве можно говорить сейчас вот о счастливом детстве наших детей, когда уже сейчас сидит и столкнулись и с бесчувствием с каким-то врачей? Все почему-то думают радиофобия. Нет, их надо лечить. Их треба рятувати зараз. Зараз, коли... Це ще такі маленькі вони, але потім ми будемо щось мати, не знаю що, яких, якось, ну, уроди будуть, розумієте? Ми вже зараз бачимо, які телята з'являються з восьмью ногами. Страшно, страшно за наших дітей, що у них буде, як вони будуть рости. All the families on the estate have the same fears. What will become of their children? Natasha Kadrova and her family are also from Pripyat. She is ill and her husband is now too sick to work. 
Her two children, aged nine and 13, are seriously ill too. They have stomach problems and enlarged thyroids. Our illnesses is like, in, like um, the illnesses of another family, you see. Mm -hmm. All our children had bad stomachs. Mm -hmm. Then something wrong with liver, terrible headaches and very shattered nerves. Mm -hmm. We go for a walk once and there was um, uh, a small rain and they said, is that rad radioactive rain? And when it was wind, they asked um, if that was radioactive wind. They w was afraid, they were afraid of um, these mm. events. This unhappy estate is full of tragic stories. This five-year-old has just had a tumor removed from her stomach. Her mother says the doctors won't tell her exactly what's wrong with her daughter. That lack of information has angered all the mothers and prompted them three months ago to form a pressure group, the Mothers of Chernobyl. Their spokeswoman is Svetlana Kipyachenko. When the first children started arriving here, we all thought that everything would be taken care of in Kyiv and that the children would end up healthy. The radiation center had been set up and we thought that the children would be given the correct diagnosis and treatment there. The trouble is that neither our government nor the doctors are revealing how many children have become ill. But we do know that a great many children are ill. The fact that all the beds at the radiology center are occupied proves that the number of ill children is considerably greater than the official statistics would indicate. So now we have had the idea that each mother should fill out a form which will be like a kind of medical identity card. We don't trust the government statistics, and so we want to compile our own statistics and documentation. The man entrusted with winning back the confidence of the mothers is Communist Minister of Health Yuri Spischenko. It's true that people weren't given the necessary information straight away, but I cannot agree with you that they don't have access to it now. They have the information, but the trouble is that they've lost their faith in the official medical channels whom they believe to be withholding information from them. The Ukraine was certainly not ready for dealing with a large-scale calamity of this kind. We didn't have the right equipment for the measurement of radiation levels, for diagnosis or treating people. And we had no experience of this kind of disaster. The first days after the incident were chaotic and we had no concrete plan of action. Do you admit that there is a lack of equipment in the hospitals? The Soviet Union is not producing enough of the kind of high-caliber equipment necessary for dealing with disasters of this kind, and there are no two ways about it. Insufficient funds are being allocated to this area. We have less than 40% of the equipment we need. We don't have the right diagnostic equipment, nor the up-to-date instruments. Last week, the two lorries from Britain arrived in the towns of Lviv and Kiev to a rapturous welcome. They were filled with desperately needed medical supplies and equipment, including syringes, bandages, drugs and wheelchairs. It's a gift that has political mileage, not for the communists, but for the growing nationalist movement and their leader, Ivan Draj. This tragedy in particular had a huge impact on the national psyche. It made them more politically aware, and this didn't only apply to the Ukrainians, but to the country as a whole. For President Gorbachev, that's a disturbing development. The Ukraine is the second largest Soviet republic with 58 million people, and makes a major contribution to the country's economy. The nationalists have made significant gains in the recent elections, and are now openly calling for an independent republic. More and more are demonstrating publicly. Last weekend in Kiev, this 30,000-strong rally was held in support of Lithuanian nationalists. Gradually, more and more people are coming round to the idea that the Ukraine should become a sovereign and independent republic without the Soviet Union. I think that the example of Lithuania shows us that it is an illusion to think that we can become a sovereign republic within the framework of the USSR. 
Приклад Литви свідчить про це. Горбачов started the democratization process. Is that now unstoppable? And can he control it? Я думаю, що Горбачов або зрозуміє, що ми мусимо I think that Gorbachev has a choice before him. He can continue along the path of democratization on which he started and give everyone the opportunity for self-development. If he does not make that choice, he is doomed to failure, because if he tries to stop the process, he will have to be crueler than Stalin ever was. If you had one message to give to Mr. Gorbachev, what would it be? Gorbachev, don't become emperor. Be a democrat. It may come as no surprise that if the nationalists ever gain power in the Ukraine, one of their first acts will be to close all of the Republic's 28 nuclear power stations. Baptists have welcomed the opportunity. Work began here in Kashenko, Russia's largest psychiatric hospital. Zhidkov now operates a daily rotor of volunteers in four of the geriatric wards. European charities have also enabled the Baptists to donate equipment. The volunteer sisters are mostly pensioners, but younger working people also give up their free time at the weekends. In the beginning, some of our sisters were a little bit puzzled to go to a, a psychiatric hospital to do with people who are insane. But we explained that uh, these are old ladies who have some problems with their thinking, but they desperately need care and personal comfort because medical personnel is very good, but they have no time our task is to show Lord's mercy through our words, our feelings, our hands, and our sisters enriched themselves uh, giving this service. And this is not obligatory, but every visit is voluntary. The Baptists have always worked very closely with the hospital's chief psychiatrist, Dr. Kozirev. Kozirev has never had any doubts about the value of their contribution. Ласку. И вот это самое главное. Больше еще. А? Еще хочешь? Вот если мы жалуемся там, что помогают нам лекарства, а они нам помогают физически, духовно помогают нам очень. И это тоже много значит. Это одно и то, что лекарства с ними хорошо сказали нам, поговорили, об, как говорится, обнадежили нас, что нам будет хорошо, мы будем верить, и что все будет хорошо. И всегда нам Бог поможет, чтобы мы только верили. Вот все, что я могла вам сказать. Это очень благотворное влияние. Если сейчас бы нам сказали, что вот с завтрашнего дня уже к вам больше не будут ходить баптист, это было бы для нас бедой, трауром и, и для всего персонала, и для всех пациентов, конечно. I ask some of them, if you live nearer to a, a new institution which we were going to serve, would you quit here? And all of them said, no, we fall in love with all these dear ladies and we will not leave them because they are waiting for us.
Ну что ты сказал? Слова тебе, ты мой хороший. Бабуленька. Just a year ago, the Baptists extended their work to Moscow's boarding school for orphans, number 28. This is home to 600 children. The Baptists visit every Saturday. Many of them are orphans, they're crippled, and they are in desperate need of love and care. And when our sisters come, they are so happy that there is someone who could care for them. На 20 детей у нас по штатному расписанию предполагается один воспитатель. Это, конечно, недостаточно, чтобы ну, дать ребенку все то, что можно дать. Доброту, внимание, ласку. И поэтому вот дефицит общения, дефицит ласки восполняется именно нашим посещением верующих. That Baptists and Baptist children are now welcomed into Russian schools is doubly ironic. Another clause of the 1929 law stipulates that religious groups should not be permitted any possible influence over the young. Moreover, it was as recently as in Stalin's time that children of believers were themselves ridiculed and persecuted by teachers in state schools. Today, the Baptist choristers are honored visitors. Трудные дети стали более уравновешенные, более спокойные. В них, ну, мы замечаем проявление каких-то начальных черт доброты, проявление доброты. Но они просто, может быть, успокоились в том плане, что они знают, что у них есть люди, которые их любят. И вот этот дефицит любви, дефицит общения, вероятно, им не хватал и даже выливался в таких трудных проявлениях черт характера. А сейчас это и есть. But perhaps the most astonishing community work began just before Christmas. Prompted by parliamentary debate about the conditions and philosophy of Soviet labor camps, the authorities granted permission for the Baptists to begin visiting a limited number of these camps. Here at Mazhayesk, a hundred kilometers outside Moscow, there are a thousand women inmates, two-thirds of whom serving sentences for murder. Despite the advances of perestroika, we were refused permission to film any of these exterior shots. Visiting the labor camps has great personal significance for Zhidkov, whose own father was sentenced, as were many others under Stalin, to eight years in a labor camp. His crime? He was a believer. Now, it is believers who are invited in to help. When I came first time to this colony, I had not feeling of uh, fear, but feeling of compassion for these people who made by mistake or emotions or some other reasons fall down in a, such a, an awful crime as a murder. But still, they're human beings, and God loves them. I was afraid that I couldn't speak to, to these people. Because I read about these people before, but when I saw them personally, and they are eager to talk and to show their problems, their pain. It was very emotional. Боже наш великий праведный, мы благодарны тебе, что ты любишь всех без исключения каждого из нас, что ты даруешь нам жизнь и эту святую возможность иметь это краткое общение с дорогими нашими друзьями. Благослови всех нас. Все это мы просим. Во имя Иисуса Христа. Аминь. Садитесь, дорогие. Сейчас группа нашего хора исполнит молитвенный гимн «Преклонись ко мне, о Боже».
these women are in most desperate uh, spiritual conditions, psychological conditions, because of the guilt, what they, uh, the memory, what they done, of course, always uh, cursing them, always biting them, and we are able to talk about that God loves everybody, even them. Many inmates talk of the comfort they get from the Baptists' visits, and particularly from the Bibles they bring. This woman is 32 and four years into a 15-year sentence for murder. Not every prison authority is allowed to visit. In some areas, they open doors. In other areas, they are suspicion. But uh, my experience is that they accept it. We have a similar aim, but different methods. In previous years, even in the difficult times, we enjoyed the victory of Easter. But this coming Easter, I say it really is a new Easter because of the new uh, opportunity to share this victory of God with others. This series continues tomorrow at 8 o'clock with the story of Alex Tomsky, who in the wake of the revolution plans to set up a new publishing house in his native Prague. There's classic comedy to be enjoyed on BBC One in just over 10 minutes with Penelope Keith languishing in the lodge but to the manor born. Here on two in 40 minutes we move into Top Gear for a look at Jaguar cars past and future plus some alternatives to the petrol engine. First we look beyond the Barrett gates into more Army Lives. Separation is a fact of life for wives of infantry soldiers. Each year, the men spend anything from between three and eight months away from home. So hush, baby, don't you cry. 
one of these mornings you's gonna rise up singing and you'll spread your wings and you'll take to the sky the Northern Ireland tour is one of the longest and most stressful. Infantry battalions take it in turns to go. For men from the Queen's Regiment, it meant leaving nearly 300 wives alone in Germany. OK, Judge, keep me in the picture what's going off. Do you all know about the incident this morning? No? Right, this morning, uh, one platoon experienced quite a lot of hassle in the lower clonards, OK, just off the falls. And a number of uh, plastic were fired, OK? Now, unfortunately, this has caused bad feeling amongst the locals. Keith is a sergeant in charge of 16 men whose job it is to patrol West Belfast. Now, should anyone die from these, let's hope not, then the situation out he there and Joan have two children, Andrew, aged five, and Timothy, aged seven. Any questions? OK, remember on the move down <coughs> in the front, just keep your eyes open. Remember the threat on mobile vehicles, especially rear one, called Riley. All right, let's go. <coughs> This tour has not been without its casualties. A number of Keith's men were injured in bomb blasts, and the battalion lost one soldier when he was shot by a sniper. Keith's hours are irregular, and phone calls home sometimes have to be made in the early hours of the morning. It is possible for Joan to call him, but only in an emergency. We've had a few casualties. Uh, in my multiple, we haven't had any fatal ones, thank goodness. And uh, it has been difficult while we've been going through them. Going back into the same area again is for the first couple of times you think, you know, God, this happened as we was going through here. And, uh, but after a while, you know, you just get back into the mode of it's a job you're doing and um, you just keep patrolling. And it sort of goes into the background after a while. On the radio. of the two investigators is an issue that's aroused huge public interest and outrage. A series of demonstrations have been held, making it clear to the authorities that many people believe the charges against the two are merely an attempt by communist hardliners to protect themselves from further investigation. In 1983, Telman Gudlayan was appointed to investigate corruption in Central Asia. But he and his colleague Nikolai Ivanov were sacked when they tried to move the focus of their inquiries towards senior officials in Moscow. Among them, the hardline Conservative Politburo member, Yegor Ligachov. The deputies had gone too far. This morning's demonstration was an attempt to prevent the backlash against them from gaining ground. The chief Soviet prosecutor has asked the Supreme Soviet to lift immunity from prosecution from Gudlayan and Ivanov so that they can face charges that they force people to fabricate corruption allegations. The demonstrators were told that not only the freedom of the investigators was in danger, but also their lives. And significantly, the rally was joined by radical members of the Moscow City Soviet, showing their solidarity with Gudlayan and Ivanov. The case of the two deputies further highlights the continuing struggle between conservatives and reformers within the Communist Party. And with a vital party congress due this summer, it's yet another intractable problem for Mr. Three months. The treatment for radiation burns is basic. There's not enough specialized equipment. Chernobyl itself is deserted. Here, they say, is an island, and the only way off is by coffin. Tonight's fundraising appeal is an attempt to build a bridge to these people. 
to make the bereaved and the suffering feel that four years on, someone still cares. Bill Neely, News at 10, Moscow. The leader of West Germany's Social Democratic Party, Mr.